All right, welcome everyone to the functional group update for what used to be the platform team. Uh, my name is Alman and I'm the engineering manager for, as of a couple of days ago, the create backend team. Uh, and I'm also the interim manager for the manage team until we find a new engineering manager there. I'll touch a little bit more on what those changes mean and why they were made uh, a couple of slides down the line. First, I'd like to take you through what we have been working on since the last time uh, I did one of these FGUs, which has been a little bit less than two months. Um, I'm going to cover more of some of these in some more detail in the upcoming slides, but this is a quick timeline of significant events in the platform team, um, you know, soon to be the create and manage teams over that period. Uh, we have been working on GitLab 11.0, 11.1, and 11.2. We actually released GitLab 11.0 and 11.1. Uh, we wrap up quarter two, which means that we had to reflect uh, retrospect on OKRs. We defined the OKRs for Q3. Um, and like I alluded to already, the team was split into create and manage. And all of these will get the appropriate airtime during this FGU. First of all, let's talk a little bit about what we've actually managed to ship over those last two months. Um, a little bit over a month ago on June 22nd, GitLab released GitLab 11.0. Some of the more com significant contributions to that release uh, that were built by the platform team are on this list. Um, Semmel single sign-on for groups on GitLab.com is a great one. It is um, officially in beta now. Uh, thank you, James Edwards Jones. Unlimited guests for free and ultimate is useful for our ultimate customers who only really want to pay for those customers who are actually, you know, significantly involved in projects on their instance. Uh, a guest is a user who either is not added to any group or project at all, or they are a user who is added to specific projects or group as a guest, which is a very restricted set of abilities, so they really can't do all that much. Uh, and for understandable reasons, customers who have a limit on the amount of seats that they can use on GitLab don't want to be paying for these users who are not actually able to do anything on that instance. Um, and then we got two more features that I wanted to call out specifically LFS files included when importing a project and improved performance of the LFS integrity check. Uh, thanks Ruben, Fran and Ruben, again, for the third, uh, fourth one on the list. And of course, there's a lot more that you can find if you follow either the GitLab 11.0 link at the top, which goes to the blog post, or the more link at the bottom, which goes specifically to the list and the issue tracker of stuff the platform worked on. Then a month after that, uh, a couple of days ago, we released GitLab 11.1. I'd like to thank Imre for a feature uh, called Initialize README on Project Creation. When you create a project through the GitLab interface, you now have the option of automatically uh, having a README file be created so that you don't need to manually do that with an extra step. Of course, you wouldn't use this feature if you already have a local repo set up that you want to push into GitLab, but this is very useful if the first step in your new uh, open source project is the actual creation of the repo on GitLab.com. This can save you a little bit of time there. We are also now using object storage for the GitLab project export feature, which allows you to export an entire project into a tarball that then can be imported into another instance or the same instance, but usually you would use this to move an entire project and all of the related data from one instance to the other. Uh, we are moving towards you know, a supporting object storage for pretty much all storage related features in GitLab uh, because we want you to be able to run GitLab on an installation where there is no persistent storage that is shared between all the different like nodes, components that make up the whole GitLab application, which is also an infrastructure design that we are in the process of moving towards. So this is a requirement for that. Uh, we also managed to ship the beginnings of a GraphQL API endpoint, specifically that one that will be a, will be um, you know capable of powering the merge request widget. It is not actually used yet by that merge request widget front end component that will require some more work for front end, but we do have a basic endpoint now, a basic GraphQL endpoint that touches all of the interesting bits like uh, you know uh, surfacing uh, querying a specific object, the nested object, surfacing simple fields, surfacing more complex fields, surfacing exposing nested relationships, things like pagination, authorization, authentication, um, and in eleven point two, which will touch on the second, we are also adding a simple example of a mutation in there. So with that, we pr pr pretty much have covered all of these standard components of a GraphQL endpoint, which means that even if it won't be used yet for the merge request widget, other teams in GitLab, other people in GitLab who are building new features can start um, from day one with a GraphQL endpoint to expose that backend data to the front end instead of um, our current approach where you would write a controller, Rails controller, which would be very specifically catered to a very specific use case um, and which would, you know, be have to kept up to date when the front end requests more or less attributes from it. This makes it um, a lot easier for the backend to give the front end an, an, an endpoint where they can then decide what attributes they do and don't need for their specific use case. 
Um, for 11.1, we also added nine bug fixes. I wanted to call it out specifically because that's most of the work we did in 11.1, bug fixes. Uh, thanks everyone who worked on those. And of course, there's a lot more that you can follow with the link at the very bottom. So that was released uh, a couple of days ago and GitLab 11.2 won't be released for another month. But of course, we have been working on GitLab 11.2 for a few weeks already. And some of the more significant things that we will be contributing to that release are in this list. Of course, more has more as always. Um, some that I'd like to specifically call out are share groups with groups, which will allow you to give another group, an unrelated group in your GitLab instance, access to a group as if they were, as if everyone who's a member of that group were themselves members of the group you're adding them to. And uh, this is can be useful if you want to invite another team, whether it be another team inside the same company or another team in another company. In the case of GitLab.com, uh, you might want to invite them to a subset of the projects in your standard group project hierarchy. Uh, you can also use this if you have a, on the one hand, a tree of groups of nested groups that you use for storing projects and the hierarchy of, you know, how the projects kind of map to uh, different maybe product areas of your company. But then you would use another group tree for specifically uh, defining teams of individuals. So you might have a larger backend team with individual backend teams under that. And then those individual backend team groups could be added to any project or any group you see fit to automatically give them access to that stuff, but none, not anything else. I'm probably doing a terrible job of explaining it, but if you follow the uh, link, you'll find a description by one of our product managers, which will be far more exhaustive. Uh, but this is something we are very happy to contribute to 11.2. Another one I wanted to say a little bit about is the status message, the third one on the list, which started out as a community contribution. Um, the feature is pretty much the same thing that you might have been using in Slack for a while, where you can set a status for yourself using an emoji and a little line of text. And this will show up anywhere you post a message as well as you know on your profile page. And it can be useful to communicate to people that you might be out for a few days or that there's something else going on in your life that you'd like to share with uh, your colleagues. And in GitLab, this will be especially useful to prevent people from assigning, for example, merge requests to you when you're out or from pinging you on issues while you're out. Uh, if they now do that, they will immediately see your name pop up with your status. So if it says out of office for the next two weeks, they'll know to ask someone else who will be available. Uh, like I mentioned, this started out as a community contribution, uh, but the community contributor indicated that they did not have time to finish it. So we decided to pick it up. Of course, they will receive the appropriate credit in, uh, in a change log, in the blog post and things like that. Um, a lot of people have already been kind of hand crawling this on GitHub.com by just adding an emoji to their full name. But that means it also shows up in some places where you probably wouldn't expect it. And it hasn't, doesn't have the nice UX that we're used to from Slack. So we're building this into GitLab as a first class feature. Um, that's, that's the two that I wanted to specifically call out. But I suggest you know, checking out all of those links and then asking any questions you might have about the feature in question there. And of course, as always, the more link will have more stuff that we're adding to 11.2. Well, that's it for the couple of releases we've been working on recently. Um, now I'd like to, to talk a little bit about that split of the platform team that I uh, mentioned a couple moments ago. Basically, the, the reason for this is that we are in the process of having our backend teams and pretty much the frontend teams and UX teams as well um, align more directly to the product areas that we have identified and that we want to focus on with GitLab, uh, the DevOps cycle that you might have seen in our handbook. And the DevOps cycle is split up in a bunch of stages. Two of those are create and manage. And for the longest time, the platform team used to kind of cover both, but then there was also one part of create, specifically code review and merge request that was actually being handled by the discussion team. So it was a little bit hard to have like PMs that do needed to deal with different backend teams and one backend team uh, platform that had did multiple PMs, product managers that we needed to talk with every month to figure out what the top priorities were for that month. Um, it was kind of hard to make sure each product area had enough people assigned to work on stuff in that product area each month because um, there were just too many people involved for too many different product areas. So we're streamlining, streamlining that a little bit. For 11.2, nothing changes because this change wasn't made until after 11.2 development already started. But with 11.3 um, and on, the people in the create team will specifically be focusing on that functionality that, that falls under the create um, step of the DevOps cycle. And the same thing will be the case for manage with their respective uh, product area. Like I mentioned earlier, I will continue to be the product, the engineering manager for the create team. Uh, and I'm the engineering manager for the manage team on the interim. We are in the process of, of hiring engineering managers, both for the manage team and some other teams that are in need of one. Um, and by the time one comes on board, of course, I'll be handing over that team. The split uh, in terms of what people go on to what side of the split 
Um, it's mostly based on where people have previous experience. Uh, the platform team used to work on a lot of stuff, but of course you see that people kind of get into an area where they do more work than the other. So we kind of try to, uh, you know, continue that with this divide. And you can also see that Oswaldo and Mark are actually coming from the discussion team uh, and will be joining the create team. Like I mentioned, merge requests used to be a responsibility of the discussion team uh, alongside everything related to issue tracking, the, the plan step in our DevOps cycle. Um, but since merge requests are now to become the responsibility of the dedicated create team, two of those developers are also uh, making that jump so that we have everyone we need to get create um, you know, to get all of that stuff done and create that we want in the rest of the year. Uh, and also Nick Thomas, who is currently on the Geo team as a staff developer, will be, I should say, returning. Well, returning isn't quite right because he used to be on the platform team and then he went for, to Geo for a while and he's not returning to platform. He is going to create instead, but that means we'll have a six person team for uh, the create step of the dev cycle. And the manage team, like I mentioned, will have four people to start, but both of these teams have two vacancies right now. We are hoping to add two developers to each team over the course of the year. So by that end of it, we will have eight people in create and six in manage. If you have any more questions about this, um, you know, feel free to ask them in chat or at the end of this FGU. But in Slack, there's also been some, um, some communication, some conversation around these issues. Uh, if you want to see some more of the background of how these decisions were made, you can follow the link to create and manage at the very top, which links to a merge request that Tommy, uh, director of backend for the dev teams, um, the merge request he created to actually apply this change. So next, the one thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is OKRs. Uh, we just wrapped up Q2 on June 30th, and I put some notes in here on how we did in that quarter two. Our key results were to deliver 100% of committed issues per release. We didn't actually deliver 100% of committed issues in any of these releases, but we had an average commit rate of 75%, uh, delivery rate, I mean, 75%. And in the latest of those releases, 11.1, .1, we managed to ship 82. Um, well, I hope that this means that there's at least a, you know, a curve that goes towards 100%, but it does mean that we need to be a little bit more, perhaps conservative about uh, how many issues we commit to delivering in a certain month, because obviously we haven't actually been able to hit that. Uh, I also wrote that under try at the very bottom. We had another key result, a goal to ship the first GraphQL endpoint to be used by an existing front-end component. As I mentioned, we shipped that endpoint in 11.1, um, except for that little mutations aspect of it, which will be going in 11.2, which is why I reckon we only hit about 80% of that in the actual quarter two. Um, then we also wanted to source 150 candidates in order to hire three. We succeeded on the sourcing, not so much on the hiring. Uh, we added Imidate to the team a little bit over a month ago and very glad that we did, but we had been hoping to add two more people by the team uh, to the team in that quarter, um, which we haven't been able to. Uh, for Q3, as I'll show you in a second, we are also planning to hire some more people, but we are in the process, um, all of backend, all of engineering is in the process of kind of revamping our hiring process to make it on the one hand more effective and also to reduce the time it takes to go from someone submitting an application until they either hear that they are hired or we reject them. All of that, there's a lot of room for improvement there and hopefully will that will allow us to uh, actually hit the hiring goal in the upcoming quarter. So speaking of the upcoming quarter, uh, 2018 Q3, our key results are first to implement 10 specific performance improvements that were identified by me and uh, Yorick from the database team. Uh, it's a mix of stuff that is directly database related uh, and there's also some stuff in there that might have to do with the time it takes for a Git push to be handled or the time it takes for a Git pool to return data. Um, these OKRs were set before the platform team was split into create and manage. So the two teams don't have their own OKRs, at least not for performance improvements. Um, they will for hiring down there. But for performance improvements, create and manage together have the goal of shipping these 10. Four of them are already being worked on for 11.2, three are scheduled for 11.3, and then we got three more coming up for 11.4. If you follow the link to performance improvements, you can see some more information about which issues those uh, are. We also have a goal of preserving 100% of the error budget. Uh, I don't know yet how we're doing there since we haven't actually released anything new in this month, or at least not something that was actually built in this month. Um, but you can follow the link to the error budgets if you want to read a little bit more about what that means, what the, what the idea is there. And then, like I mentioned, both the create and manage teams have their own hiring goals. Um, like I mentioned, both teams have two vacancies, but those are two vacancies that we plan to fill in the coming six months of the year. So Q3 and Q4. In Q3, we really want to add one person to uh, each team. Um, and to help us with that, we have already sourced 25 people 
um, 50 in total for both teams. We don't source specifically for create and manage because the requirements in terms of you know, tech skills and experience are pretty much the same. Um, so across backend, we've sourced over 100 people um, and 50 of those I was responsible for. All right, so that's everything we've been working on for the last two months. If you have any questions about that, uh, you'll get a chance to ask those in a sec because I'd also like to quickly give you an idea of what we plan to do um, before we speak again uh, two months from now. Of course, we're going to be developing, building both GitHub 11.2 and 11.3. So by the time we speak again, I'll be able to tell you a little bit about what we've contributed to those releases. Um, we'll also be going to the GitHub Summit in Cape Town. We'll be there for a week, but of course, a lot of people are adding vacation before or after, and there's some people who need to travel for 30, words upward, 30 hours upwards. So um, 11.3 is probably not going to be the biggest release in terms of uh, you know, number of issues or outputs, uh, but we're going to make sure it's a good one because um, it will, of course, be very nice to be able to work on some of this stuff together from Cape Town as well. But it's not going to be a week where we're just going to be sitting behind our laptops doing what we otherwise would have been doing at home. So you'll probably see that reflected in uh, the actual 11.3 release. But I'll touch on that in the next FTU. And then, of course, just before um, the next FTU, we're also going to kick off the development of GitLab 11.4. If you want to know what's going to go into GitLab 11.3 and GitLab 11.4, I suggest joining the kickoff that we have on the 8th of August and 8th of September. You can find the link uh, on this page. I uh, linked the word kickoff. That's it for the past two months and the upcoming two months. Are there any questions about any of what I've said? If not, I'm going to count down from 10, 9, 8, Seven, six. Oh, this is exciting. Um, <laughs> I said. I, and I, I think it feels weird interrupting someone in a countdown. So I, I, I yeah, do a countdown. I, I, I do that. a silent countdown, like let's, 10 seconds for questions or something. Um, Good points. And, and try to try to try to keep it at 10 minutes. So, um, so people feel almost obliged to ask a question because otherwise it's too too short because if you get one question, you, you, you tend to get more. Yeah, um, that's a good point. And just to comment on that, uh, we used to do these FGUs, I think, every once every five weeks, but now we're on a once every two months schedule, which means that you'll want to say more about those past two months, which of course increases the time it will take to go over all of it. Um, at least that's an issue that I ran into, but that's something to discuss elsewhere and resolve. You elsewhere. know what? I was able to read your slides uh, much faster than you were able <laughs> Probably, to yeah. read them out. So just just write, write it down, whatever you have to communicate, write it down in the slides, but don't feel obliged to read your slides. We, every single person working at GitLab can read. <laughs> I'm glad, yes, that's true. So it's, it's, it's totally fine to, uh, to have them read. Um, I was wondering for the managed team, you list both yeah. Jeremy and Andreas as a product manager on the slide number six. Um, I think Jeremy is officially the, uh, PM for manager. One of the goals was to have one PM per per team. Uh, how does uh, Andreas factor into that? I thought he was on Geo. I gotta say, I'm not completely sure what the latest status is there. Um, initially, Tommy, I, and Eric, and some others had proposed to split pre platform into what would be three teams: create, admin, and share. As I'm sure you're aware, and then kind of admin would have Jeremy as a PM, and share would have Andreas, and then they were merged. And I'm not completely sure what that actually. Um, you know, what the accompanying change was on the product side of things. When I last talked about it with Jeremy and Andreas, it seemed that Andreas was still handling some of the issues uh, that are now part of Manage. I'm not completely sure what the latest status is there from a product perspective. Okay, so the, the, the product categories page, which is the canonical page and should be the single source of truth, lists only Jeremy as uh, for the Manage. So uh, I, I think uh, Andreas, although he might have some work in progress, that, that's still there, but he should... Uh, he should be go. Uh, he should be uh, gone off and do other things than uh, than work with the managed team. And there was uh, maybe it's good to to detail this. Uh, there was some concern with the managed team that it was too much because it's a pretty broad scope. Uh, on the other hand, currently there were two people working on all the things in the managed scope. So we had this on one hand, we thought, wow, the managed team, they have to do so much. On the other hand, hey, if we look at who's actually doing the work, it's two people. So we figured based on that, that it would be appropriate to have one product manager and one team for the entire scope of manage things. Yes, it's broad, but on the other hand, if you look at who's doing it today, it's, it can be done by two people. So uh, even though we may 
quadruple the number of people working on it to about eight. Uh, that that is still uh, one team and, and one PM should be able to supply them with issues. Right. Thanks for that clarification and uh, expansion on the managed team. Um, I think no other questions have come up. So thank you, Sid, for yours. And everyone, have a, you get 10 minutes back, and I'll see most of you in the team call. Cheers. Thanks.